Hi, everyone. So my name is Leanne Wynn, and I am a shark ambassador with Sharks for Kids. Thank you so much for joining us today, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are around the globe. Um, on today's talk, you'll note that you're going to be muted. Um, myself and the individual I'm hosting are going to be the ones talking. So if you have any questions, please feel free to add them under with the Q&A. There's a Q&A section at the bottom. I will be online the entire time answering some questions on the back end. And then also after the presentation, we'll do some questions live. For those of you who are not familiar, Sharks for Kids is a volunteer group. So we're a group of shark enthusiasts. Some of us are scientists, videographers, educators, divers, people of all sorts. And what we're really trying to do is create a next generation of shark advocates. And how do we do that? By hosting events like this. We do webinars, um, we have online chats, we do online classes, we do in-person, go to conferences, festivals, so many different things. And one thing that is at your fingertips at all times is our website, sharksforkids.com. It's a slew of lots of educational information and fun activities and crafts. So today, for today's Shark Talk, I am pleased to have with me my friend Vicki Vasquez, who studies lost sharks. So before you get into the nitty gritty of everything, Vicki, who is actually studying at Moss Landing Marine Lab, by the way. Tell us, how did you get into this? Hey, cool. Um, so again, hi everybody. Uh, nice to be here. And the way that I got into sharks is actually kind of neat. It's because I first was into the ocean and I was really lucky. So I'm originally from San Diego and uh, my mom is Mexican, so she has a lot of family there. And then my dad's Venezuelan, so he has uh, family there. So basically what was happening is I would go on these like family vacations and I would notice that the oceans were different in these different places, which was weird to me because I just thought it was all just like it was in San Diego. And so from there is how I just became interested in the marine world and then, um, I've always grown up fishing, so I'm sure you guys can guess what came around after a little bit from fishing. And um, when I first saw a shark, that was, that was it. I thought they were really cool. And what I loved the most about sharks is from what I had seen in Shark Week and them being scary, in real life, they weren't scary. They were just kind of swimming like the guy behind me is, and they just seemed really, really smart. So it was fun to watch them because I could try to guess how they were thinking as they were coming around our boat, trying to figure out like what is going on here. So that helped. Awesome, that is cool beans. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now you're studying lost sharks. Can you tell us what do you mean by lost sharks? Yes, so um, I even have a little picture for you guys. So I'm gonna awesome. do the share screen. Yes. Okay, cool. So um, the first thing I wanted to show you guys, ooh, we'll go back really fast, just for fun. Um, there, oh, there's actually a picture of me in this PowerPoint from when like I was a little kid and you can uh, see me fishing with my uh, grandfather. So um, the over here, that's me when I was probably seven. And that's me fishing in Venezuela. So you can see, you know, nice blue water, tiny little fish in my hand. And then you go over and you see me fishing as a kid in San Diego. And now we're talking about some cool open ocean water fish. Whereas in Venezuela, in the tropical environment, we were dealing with a lot smaller fish. So that was one thing. But now let me tell you about lost sharks. Okay. So lost sharks are basically lesser known species of sharks but we have a huge problem and the problem is that we're still trying to figure out what that means and so let me give you an example uh, my professor is the one that's known for doing lost sharks and when i say lost if you look it up just to warn you i am not talking about any of the sci-fi movies or any tv shows and their conspiracy theories i am talking about something like this 
Now, this is an article that my professor was in a couple of years ago. Um, there's much more recent stuff, but the reason I like this one is because I know I can't hear you, but I would love if you guys just shout it out if you know what species of shark this is. And this is the part where y'all go, hammerhead shark. Okay, so this is a hammerhead shark. Uh, most of us are pretty familiar with how they look because their heads are so distinctive. And so that's not the best example of a lost shark. And that's not to say hammerheads don't need conservation or protection. They definitely do. But lost sharks is a whole different ball game. That's a lost shark. So you can kind of see it looks like um, something that's made up, like not even real. But that right there is a ghost shark. And that is what a lost shark is. Um, the cool thing about lost sharks is that they have a lot of fun names. So I wanted to show you this cartoon because one, it kind of crap, uh, it catches your attention. But then look, this, these are the animals that were really um, the common names of the ones you saw um, in the next, uh, in the previous slide. So let me go back really first. Okay, so I like the the green lantern shark. Um, I happen to be a fan of lantern sharks. We'll get into that later, and then. Take a look over here, and that's the green lantern shark. So they don't always look they, the way they do in these cartoons, right? But once you kind of see something like this, and you see like there's a lollipop cat shark, and boom, there it is. They call it a lollipop cat shark because it, its head's so big and the rest of its body's kind of small. Um, but now the most important thing, I think, is that somebody knows that the lollipop cat shark exists. Somebody now knows that that green lantern shark exists. And that is what um, a lot of the work in my lab is, is just trying to bring attention to these lesser known species. And we do that with science. So um, outreach like we're doing today is awesome because I can tell you while wow, they're cool. And then um, at the lab, we study them and also try to give brand new information that people never knew before or just kind of reminding people like, hey, this animal's here, we barely know nothing, um, so we need to keep working on it. Uh, so, um, Leanne, feel free to uh, drop in at any time with a question. But I thought I would tell you guys the story of a new species that I discovered, okay? So, um, this is all going to be mainly about one species, but I did take a look at the Q&A and I know that there were some questions about things that weren't these. So, I will definitely answer those afterwards. Um, but, this is how the story starts. It's a jar. Looks kind of boring. Uh, I was trying to go on a international trip searching for sharks. And in my attempt to convince my professor to do that, because I also speak Spanish, you can see this shark came from Panama. So, yo pensé que tal vez si hablo español, me dejaran ir a un lugar bien, bien interesante como Panama. So, I thought I could impress them with my Spanish. If you are a fluent speaker, you know I have an accent, but I can still communicate. So, I got this jar, and it was about a 20-minute walk from my house because it was in a museum. So, I didn't quite need my Spanish, but it was, it seemed like a disappointment at first, but let me show you why it became cool. This was the shark that they gave me. It had been in a jar for like five years. It smelled super gross. And I'm thinking like it'd be a lot cooler to be like, on, you know, like the shows on Shark Week when the blue water and then you tag a shark. But here's why I got more interested. That's what the shark looked like brand new. So I had this new shark and it looks really cool. Look how bright that green eye is because they live in the deep sea and it helps them see better. This shark has two spines on its dorsal fins. So you can kind of see here, uh, the older picture you can see a little bit better than you can over here. And that's because the uh, spines are very clear. And so in a, back, back, a black background, much easier to see, but on this white one, you may not even notice it was there. But that's not even the coolest thing about these sharks. These sharks are called lantern sharks because they glow in the dark. 
So as soon as I figured that out, that blew my mind because I was thinking like hammerheads look crazy and we always talk about them. White sharks are insane. They like shoot out of the water. And why aren't we talking about one that glows in the dark? That is like the coolest thing ever. So the world of the lantern sharks. Um, they actually come from a bigger group called dogfish. And what we do know about dogfish is crazy. So the background that you saw from when I was speaking, uh, this is the group that it comes from as well, the dogfish. Um, so dogfish on my background. Um, oh, quick question. Can you, do you see my screen and me talking or do you guys see just the screen? I want to figure out. Just the screen. Just the screen. Okay. So I'm going to do stop share because every once in a while you probably should know that I exist. <laughs> so um, what you were just looking at was this uh, screen with a bunch of cool sharks on it. But then I wanted to figure out how the lantern sharks look. So now I'm going to do a quick screen share so that you can see what makes a lantern shark cool. Um, and that is going to, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that and then it's going to go through. Okay. So what you're looking at here from this screen share is this blue body. That's the underside of a lantern shark. And in the other picture, you can see that spine that I was talking about. So from what you already know about these lantern sharks, they might sound a little scary but you should not be scared of lantern sharks because they're also the smallest sharks in the world. We are so obsessed with the big ones, and including me. It, it's amazing to think about how large these animals are in the world and the biggest ones are in the ocean and we don't see them all the time. But this one, also a shark, can be about the size of your hand. So pretty small, not very intimidating, unless you're a plankton or like a super small crab, then you would be terrified. Just kidding. Okay. Well, uh, some people are saying they can actually see, so they can actually see you as well as when you're sharing. So if you want to go back to presenter mode and show the pictures because they're so cool. Yes. Okay. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to do. But um, I realized that just looking at a screen can be uh, a little boring. But now that I know you can definitely see my background, I just want to again point out. So this is a spiny dogfish that I have here. It was. Um, taken by a group called Mare, who goes into uh, deep water areas with a remote operated vehicle, an ROV, and they are able to document the deep sea world. And so this guy right here, the reason I like talking about him is just because I found out that spiny dogfish have really long lines. So again, people are always obsessed about like, how long can a white shark live? I've heard 60 years and 80 years. But this guy is like 100 years for sure, maybe 150. It's crazy how old some sharks really are out there. Now, let's go back to Edger Sharks. Okay, so this um, is basically where we're at at the story where I know I have a new species because I've looked and I compared to all those other dogfish that I showed you. Lantern sharks, there's actually multiple species of them, which is why we know that they glow on their bellies and that they have these spines. But there is like over 40 species. So can you imagine there's 40 different types of glowing sharks in the ocean and that's not something we talk about every day. So the new species uh, that I was able to find, and when I say I, I obviously also mean my uh, professor, uh, Dr. Ebert, who is, um, gets a lot of this information. And then um, for us in grad school, we, um, he passes them off to us and then we, we study them. And so this one, um, is how it looks fresh. You can see much, much nicer pictures than what I showed you before. And then I had no name for it. And so I wanted to get some help on that. And that's where these guys come in. So those are my cousins. And my cousin, oh wait, my, is my screen sharing paused? 
You can see it now, right? Okay. I see it. Cool. Um, so what you're looking at are my cousins that helped me try to come up with a name because I didn't want this new lantern shark to kind of live the same life as the other 40 lantern sharks. And just like we kind of know it exists and that's it. So they came up with a really good name. Uh, they called it the Ninja Lantern Shark, named for its uniform black coloration and reduced four fours, which are reminiscent of a ninja's stealthy style and typical outfit. So what do I mean by that? Um, you would think that something that glows is trying to bring attention. But if you remember that photo that I showed earlier, here, the Lantern Sharks, that underside of the body, it's glowing. Okay, ready? This is really weird. That's camouflage! So, if you're into Harry Potter, then you're probably well aware of an invisibility cloak. Um, so, that is sort of what these sharks are doing with their bellies because they are completely covering their shadow. Now, to make this make sense, I want you guys to imagine you're like on a boat and you're looking down into the water. And then you see some sort of like silhouette shadowy thing. And you're thinking like, oh, I wonder what that is. Like there's something in the water. I can't tell what it is, but I know there's something because I can see its dark shadow. If you were a lantern shark, you could glow just enough to make your shadow go away. Now, when I gave you my example, I'm on a boat looking down. And so that is why animals like a great white shark might have like a nice dark back to them. So it's harder to see. But in this case for the lantern sharks, they're worried about an animal that's looking at them from below. And so this uh, light here completely covers their silhouette. Now, the, going back to the name, um, the other thing that's important is having a scientific name. And I, oh, before I get into that, I just want to point out, as I mentioned before, um, this was actually a, a, a project with uh, two uh, very well experienced scientists. So I am the graduate student and Dr. Do you wanna, Dave Ebert. Icky, I'm so sorry. Do you want to press present so that way it's like big screen so they can see it really big? Yes, I thought that's what it did. Oh, I know what to do. Okay. Is it big? No. There you go. Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay. So this was really neat because we had uh, two experts. So one, Dr. Ebert, the professor I was telling you about, but I didn't tell you about Dr. Long. So when we talk all the time about these sharks that exist, we're just talking about the ones that are extent. So extent meaning the ones that are currently alive with us. But Dr. Long is an expert on all the sharks that are extinct. And there's like way more of these fossil sharks than there are the sharks currently in the oceans, which totally blew my mind. So that meant that to discover this new species, we had an expert of the sharks currently around us and an expert from the sharks that had been really cool. Um, now, when it comes to the scientific name, Edmopterus, even though, ooh, let me go back. Edmopterus, even though that comes uh, first, you can think of that like your last name. It basically shows the connection to you and the rest of your family. Benchlii is kind of like your first name. And so we actually named the shark after Peter Benchley. Um, is anyone familiar with Jaws? I'm going to assume a bunch of people said yes. Um, so he is the author of the book Jaws, which turned into a movie. And many of you, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, you might know that it created a very negative uh, stereotype for sharks that was really hard um, to shake off. And as a result, it encouraged some people uh, to kill sharks because they thought they were helping other people by you know, killing this dangerous thing. But then Peter Benchley felt so bad about how scary his scary movie was. He wasn't trying to be, you know, convince us that all sharks are bad. He just wanted to make a cool story. And so as a result of this, he actually spent the rest of his life dedicating it to the ocean. So we thought it'd be really cool because most people, when they hear Benchley, they might be thinking, 
you know, white shark jaws. And when they see this, they might be thinking like, why would you name a shark after Peter Benchley? And so it was our way of showing a side of Peter Benchley that maybe a lot of people aren't aware of. And in doing so, we can also highlight a shark that not a lot of people are aware of. So that is the basic story um, of the ninja lantern shark. And let me just double check. Okay. There are some cool pictures that um, I wanted to show you just really quickly. And this is from my uh, trip to Japan. So one of the things that's becoming more and more important for scientists is to do things like what we're doing right now. Just talking about this science. There's so much to learn out there that it's very common, I, especially in the past, I think, for scientists to just keep going. They go, they find a question, they answer it, and then they go to another question or they elaborate on that question and they kind of forget to tell everybody. And so um, my ability to communicate uh, science and research gave me the opportunity to go to Japan to look for more lost sharks. And so what I thought would be fun in what I do in presentations is I show you none of the sharks. <laughs> I uh, show you a redfish or a uh, this right here is a snipe eel like look how long it you know really is and skinny um, and you're looking a, like a really small crab it reminds me of yeti crabs where there's these deep sea species and also it looks furry but this is a very very small crab and was not as deep as those so I don't know what species it is which makes it cool um, right over here, we have a sea spider. Um, I am not a fan of spiders, so if you're afraid of sharks, I understand if it was a spider. And so, I thought this sea spider was really, really cool um, because I took a lot of pictures of it and I looked at it really closely and it kind of helps um, when something's scary, usually it's scary because you don't understand it. And it was really neat to get to see uh, spiders in a different situation, the ocean. That made me like them a little more. Um, should we go into questions? I'm sure some people have questions already. I've been able to answer. Um, we have just general questions, but, but here's a question which people always wonder, which is your favorite species? Oh, good question. Uh, my favorite species is a cookie cutter shark, which is actually related to lantern sharks. Um, and that means they're very small. My joke with cookie cutter sharks is that cookie cutter sharks are not going to eat you. They'll just leave a scar. <laughs> and that's because cookie cutter sharks are known to be ectoparasites. Um, that means that they're on the outside of something that they want to take advantage of parasitize, eat, um, as opposed to one that's a parasite that's inside your body. Ugh. Now, what this guy does, it's very short and sweet. This cute little shark comes over, he goes around, and then he makes a really fast circle, and then he swims away because he just takes cookie cutter shapes out of really big things like whales or maybe like a white shark, um, and then he takes off. Uh, the, like a lantern shark, this guy also, um, looks to possibly glow some, and so they might also be camouflaging. Um, this is not a very fast shark, so what I'm thinking it does, it just hangs out in the ocean, hiding, waits for somebody to get really close, and then he goes, <laughs> he takes a chunk and he swims away. <laughs> so I always thought that was really cool. How did you learn, how did you learn that it actually glowed? Ooh, good question. Okay. So with the species, um, with uh, the group lantern sharks, it was something that was already known or expected from this group. But here's something that's really cool about lantern sharks. The parts that glow when you look at a body, like, oh, hey, look, I happen to have some lantern shark looking animals. Let's see if I can get them on the screen. There we go, sort of. Okay, um, I might have to remove my school background. Yeah, all right. Uh, I will reveal the background. Dun, dun, dun. 
virtual background. None. Ah, my house. Okay. So this guy should be a little bit easier for you to see now. And uh, there is a glare. I go oh, you see the open. eye. There we go. Cool. And so, again, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see with the glare. I'm trying to put it further down. Um, and I'm trying to find a good part of the body here because when I do, oh, here we go. It's like right here. Let me know if you can kind of see it. You're going to see different colorations on the sides of this. And the reason that's interesting, and maybe not great to see in this picture, but when we're done here, you can definitely Google lantern sharks. And what you're going to see is these really cool lines along the body, because those dark lines are actually the photophores. And what was interesting about studying the ninja lantern shark is the parts that make it glow were not as obvious. And so that meant to really find the photophores, which are these like little glowing cells, and then they have a bunch of these little dots. So I had to use a, a microscope, a compound microscope, to like, it's like a dissecting scope, I shouldn't say micro, dissecting scope, and I could see all the little dots. And so the ninja lantern shark is one of the only species of lantern sharks that has none of those obvious little markings. Um, which we think is really interesting um, because instead they do have those photophores, but the skin is so dark and they're patched around that you can't see them quite as well as the others. So that was a really neat thing to check out. Thank you. Well, speaking of the lantern sharks, again, we have some like specifics. What's their maximum size that they can reach? So what we think is the maximum size is somewhere around three to four feet. Um, the largest one that we know of so far, I believe, is um, a species uh, up in Europe. Uh, and I think it's just called like the great, the great lantern shark because it's so big. Um, but yeah, big for lantern sharks, like three feet. Cool. Well, how, how deep are we talking can they live? Ooh, good question. Um, so right now, where we think we find a lot of lantern sharks are along continental slopes. And now that I said that, I'm sure everyone's like, oh, I got it now. Just kidding. <laughs> so what you want to think about is your continent and, you know, some other tectonic stuff over here. And then you have the slope. So as the ocean's getting deeper, just a little bit offshore, uh, there's this slope. And then they're seeing and finding lantern sharks along there. And that could be a huge range of depths. Um, it can be as shallow as like 80 meters, which to us won't seem shallow because in feet, that's like uh, 2,400 feet or so. Um, and that's shallow. But these things can get to thousands of meters. So think about something that's... I don't know if you hear that fire alarm, but... Um, Think of something, uh, 1,300 meters. Now multiply 1,300 times 3.3, .3, and you can see that um, we're talking about animals that live at areas where there is no light coming in. Interesting. How much do they weigh? Ooh, good question. Um, the ones that I dealt with, we never like formally weighed them, but part of it's because once we have it in a jar and it's been like that for five years, we're not going to get an accurate weight. So if we were to do something like that, it would be for some cool experiment where we really wanted to know the weight of a shark that's been in a jar for five years. So I don't know when that's going to happen. <laughs> but when I was working with them, they all felt like they were under a pound. And so to give you an idea of that, um, if you, if anybody has a cat at home, your cat, assuming you have like a decent sized cat, is heavier than a lantern shark for the most part. Um, I'm guessing, if we're talking about a shark that's like three feet long, um, I've never hold, held the giant, the biggest lantern shark in the world, but I can't imagine it's that much heavier than your cat. But every time you hold your cat or small dog, think that, oh, this is lighter than a lantern shark. Unless it's a chihuahua. Chihuahua, maybe. We're talking about like competitors. 
<laughs> um, what do they what do they mainly eat? Oh, this is a really interesting thing and something that's really helpful when you have multiple uh, species. So we don't know a lot about the ninja lantern shark, but we've learned bits and pieces from other lantern sharks and we can assume that they do similar things. And to help uh, prove that, you can look at the teeth. And now I'm going to show you the jaws of a ninja Ooh. lantern shark. All right. Don't be scared. All right, suspense, suspense, here we go. Da, 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 da. Oh, see how awesome. small that is? Let's see my terrible nail polish. Ah, there we go, better. Um, so what you're looking at, if I get really close, is the, um, oh, oh no, that's right. Uh, these are the bottom teeth right here, and you can see that they're very pointy. And then if I go like this to show you the top teeth. They're down. There we go. They're really flat. Maybe a white background was not the best. Oh, here we go. Don't mind the wild aid postcard. But here we go. And now you can see that the teeth here are like squares as opposed to these here that are really pointy. So again, sorry if you can't see this um, perfectly well, but how about I show you a picture? And because of looking at things like teeth, those are the same teeth that all um, specimens of lantern shark have. Mm -hmm. And so we can therefore assume that they're equipped to eat similar things, which are just going to be things like small fish. Um, they will also eat, oh darn, I don't have a picture here of the jobs. Um, before we leave, I can open up a different presentation and look. Okay. So um, for now, stop sharing screen. Okay, so we think that these are just eating, these animals are just eating small things like little crabs and fish. Uh, if it's, if they're bigger than it, they're going to eat it is basically the thing. And what we think they're also doing is um, they're living, we think like near the bottom, sure, but not on the bottom, which means that they're going to want to look for fish that are kind of like right in front of them. Um, animals that maybe are on the bottom or searching on the bottom, obviously they're looking for something that they can go down on. These guys, based on the teeth and everything else, just might be going like this. Oh. Um, for well, I want to take a moment and do a shout out to Jennifer's daughter, Sophia, um, who actually, they live in the U.S. and they also have Venezuelan roots. And she wanted yeah, yeah. to be a daughter. Sophia wants to be a marine biologist also. She oh, speaks Spanish and is really shy. So it really meant a lot to share your story. And that was really... Hey important to talk about bilingual in the field. Oh yeah, that makes me so happy. Um, one, thank you for sharing that. And two, I'm going to change my background. Now we have a different fish. Cool. Uh, that was really awesome to hear. And, and yes, I, I think it's great uh, when you have a lot more international connection because one of the most difficult things for science is to give everyone the same opportunity. If you're in a country that has better funding, if you're in a country that's a little bit uh, uh, more stable, then it's easier to go through these things. And uh, right now, as many of you guys are probably aware, uh, people are sheltering in place. There's people are trying to be really careful and not get each other sick. And so things like that can affect uh, science. And so um, what's happening right now is kind of an interesting example of what can happen on a smaller case. And again, not something that makes you sick, but something that's happening in your world that's way bigger, um, or at least feels way bigger, and then you can't do the science. And so I've always wanted to study um, a lot of the animals that live in Venezuela because there is actually a Venezuelan shark. That's its name. It's the... Venezuelan dogfish, I believe. And um, I also went to the Dominican Republic um, over last summer and I got to meet some of their ichthyologists. 
And they, uh, and so the reason I'm bringing up these two places is one, my family's from Venezuela, so I'm obsessed about like looking and learning more, but I can't go there to study it. I would love to, but it's, it's not a good time. And so when I went to the Dominican Republic, I was really excited because it was, it was a Latin American country and I was able to get in touch with some of the uh, scientists there. There's a really cool one that I met. Her name's uh, Patricia Torres. And um, I have a video, which I got to share of her later. She's in charge of their whole fish collection. And she does a great job trying to figure out what each little fish or shark is. But can you imagine if you didn't have like enough jars? And that's actually like a real problem there. And it's hard for them to keep certain things separate if they don't have enough jars to do it. And so that's why I think it's interesting to learn about some of the other problems in other places, because uh, for me, I could be like jars, here's, here's 20 jars, you know? And so that's why if you uh, may be from the United States, but you have connections other, where, other places, um, if they're having any issues in the future, um, if you're a scientist, you'll know about those science problems. And if you can help them, that's really cool. Thank you. Um, speaking about worldwide, can you give us an estimate on how many ninja lantern sharks there are around the world? Oh, okay. Really good question. Ninja lantern sharks are the very first and only species of lantern shark found off of Central America's Pacific Ocean. Um, we have found other lantern sharks um, that are, you know, around Africa. There's some around um, Northern Europe in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they seem to, you know, like 40 species around the world, um, you know, all, all living and, and having very similar lives, but different species. It's very weird. Cool. Um, we had someone, Lindsay was asking, since we were talking about media and so forth, and you brought up, you know, sci-fi movies and so forth, what's your suggestion on a good movie that gives a good impression of sharks? Oh, that's hard, because if you're going to ask my favorite sci-fi, I was going to say Sharknado. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not the nicest to the sharks in there. Um, so I will say really quickly, in terms of, like, bad movies, um, I, I like to watch the bad movies because it's a reminder that they're bad movies um, and that they should be funny like that. But when you're talking about a, a movie that puts sharks in a really good light, honestly, it's, they're really, really hard to find. And usually they're documentaries. And so it's the story of someone who maybe learned to, to become interested with sharks. In terms of like a non-fiction movie that includes sharks, I can't think uh, 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 Finding Nemo, I think, is, is the closest. Uh, or Dory. Yeah, can you think of any? Or, or Finding Dory. Finding Dory, yes. If it's uh, besides a cartoon, I'm not sure. Uh, um, is, I would like Island of the Sharks, so much a documentary, but it's really cool footage. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question and, you know, something that's a really good example of you can be in different fields but you can still have an interest and come back so for example if you were like more in, into like uh you know like the the tv world you know maybe you get really good at that and your specialty is dating shows <laughs> but then because you have that talent you're like oh this shark over here i learned about it and i think it should have its story told and now you know how to do that yeah yeah no that's great uh, I just want to give another shout out, which is really cool. Um, Jennifer Ann said, thank you again for sharing your story. Her seven-year-old Lumina is interested mm -hmm. in being a shark scientist. And it was really nice to hear um, from pro pro prominent scientists that have become interested at similar ages. Um, yeah. well, it's really great to know that you started because, you know, at such a young age and continued on. So... Yeah, and you know, one cool thing, um, Lumina, is that right now, because of all the internet stuff, which I didn't have as a kid, there's so much you can start to do and learn now. And the coolest, coolest thing that I had no idea about as a kid was citizen science. 
So the idea that whenever you want, you can help scientists, you just have to look and see what are, which are the citizen science projects in your neighborhood. And you'll be surprised, there probably is one. That's, what's the, so you changed your background. What type of shark do you have behind you now? Behind me, I have a seven gill shark. Um, the reason I like to show the seven gill is because I live by the San Francisco Bay and everybody talks about white sharks in the San Francisco Bay. And so what I like to say is, have you heard about a two to 300 pound shark that gets to around nine feet that always lives in San Francisco Bay and eats seals? And it's like, it's this guy. Now, I know I just made them sound scary, which is kind of my favorite part because if you can find an image close up of a seven gill shark, it kind of looks like someone with no teeth smiling, like, <laughs> which is not scary. <laughs> so that's why I think they're fun. Can you tell our viewers why do we call it, why was it given that name? Why is it? Ooh, seven. Yeah. Okay. So pretty much all uh, elasmobranchs, so that sharks, rays, all their, all their friends, they have five gill slits on each side, right? Like right here to help them breathe. But there's these older sharks that have six to seven. And so what do you think you call one with seven gills? <laughs> the gill. Seven, seven gill shark. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome, cool. Oh, but um, one cool thing, this is a broad nose seven gill shark. Um, there is a sharp nose seven gill shark. Um, I got to see one for the first time in Japan. And so again, you can just imagine you're looking at this nose and it's very like kind of, you know, broad, kind of like smushed. And then if it was a sharp nose, obviously it'd be much more pointed and angular. Awesome. Well, we are kind of little bit here lots of people saying thank you so much it's really cool you know for sharing etc you know such an inspiration um, and especially you know involving young kids in the naming of the ninja lantern shark um, do you are there any other questions let's see any other last minute questions no? well, you know I saw somebody said that they're really into mako sharks so yes. I was just I wanted to show this is, oh, I better take away my background again. I have, what I'm about to show you when I take away my background is a, oh, oh no, come back. Here we go. <laughs> is a um, Mako shark head. There we go. Mako sharks are um, known to be the fastest sharks in the world. Um, I have a lot of specimens like this, so, so dead things. If anyone's curious, I didn't kill anything. But a lot of times, it's, it's sounds kind of weird. It's, it's not easy to find dead stuff, but dead stuff does wash up on the beach. So um, you can see that they have really pokey long teeth. This is completely different from the ninja lantern shark. And this is why we know without question that they eat different, different stuff. So this guy's more into fast, squishy fish. Awesome, thank you. And I just wanna highlight one more. Um, Jorge has been asking lots of really cool specifics about like, where are they? How big are they? What is their size and so forth? And he asked me um, specifically if they lay egg cases. So, so glad you asked to talk about their reproduction. Well, how about we start with some egg cases? These are called mermaid purses. Um, really, really neat. Um, you can find these in uh, sharks and uh, and also like Did different types of rays. <laughs> yeah, look, we're AK buddies. <laughs> these are actually things you can find in the beach. Did you find yours in the beach? Yes. Cool. Yeah. So for those of you that live near beaches, I do know that there are different projects. Um, I don't know if you know any Jillian in your area, but they want to know when you find these because it'll help yes. them try to guess where they live. We actually, yeah. actually, last week gave a talk with, we did a webinar with Kat Gordon from the Great Case Hunt. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's always a fun one to share around April, because, you know, eggs. <laughs> so egg hunting, that's why we did it. Yeah. 
Um, but in the case of the, the uh, ninja lantern sharks, what we think is happening is that instead of laying an egg like this, they have some sort of internal egg. And then when the sharks are born, it kind of looks like live birth, but it's not. So very interesting. Um, shark reproduction is really interesting. I know someone's going to talk about that. Did it already happen or is it coming up? We did, we do, we did have a talk. We, and we talk about it periodically depending on different species. Like tomorrow when Lindsay talks about bull sharks, she can talk about it. Um, yeah, sorry. Lindsay's awesome. Uh, I hope you guys uh, check her out tomorrow. And um, it's the, it, the fact that there's different ways to talk about shark reproduction is just another example of how cool they are. Like, can you imagine spending 30 minutes talking about animal reproduction and being interesting. And then you could do another episode of it and it's totally different. Like totally. that's something I think is really cool about sharks. It is. And we actually talking about the egg cases, you know, we have some activities. We just came out, especially for Easter and you know, egg, egg hunts and so forth. We came out with some activities. Um, so I think this is a good time to say thank you so much for everybody, you know, asking their questions and so forth. And thank you so much for joining us. And I'm actually going to go ahead over and just share for a moment. I will share my screen as well. Share screen, here we go. And just let everybody know so you can see here, here we go, this was the talk we were doing. If you go to Sharks for Kids website, Okay, we have all the webinars that actually we already did. So the one that we were just referring to and also the ones that we're referring to coming up. So tomorrow we have one on bull sharks of Fiji, which is really cool beans. So definitely check it out. Also again, crafts. When we're discussing crafts, if you're a painter, we have some paint by numbers. Uh, we have Ooh. case matching games. You, if you want to make something, you can make a little shark box. All right. And if you're not so much into the arts and crafts, but you want some information and facts, okay, definitely check out. Whoops, it's a little slow. There we go. Definitely check out. We have workshops, we have all this curriculum. All right. So it's a wealth of information. So definitely check that out, our website, and continue to follow us on. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. Check out Vicky, check out myself, check out Sharks for Kids. All right. So question. Yes. Uh, the activities that you guys have in the crafts, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming they're kind of geared towards kids, but I thought, like, is it is it weird if adults do it? Because, like, for teachers and stuff, yeah. No. That'd be cool. Especially <laughs> color by numbers, it is so good for the mental palette. So it is really great. And we try to make them, that's a great question. We try to make them so that way they can be for multiple age range. There's different ways that you can enhance it and make it even more challenging. You can match by picture or you can match by name or scientific name or information. So you can always challenge yourself even more based on your age group. Never stop. Cool. So again, from me to you and from everyone around the world, thank you so much, Vicki, for sharing and talking with us. Thank you everyone for joining us. And again, please, we hope you're all safe and healthy and we wish nothing but the best to all your families around the world. Mucho gusto. Gracias. Thank you so much, everyone.